Kia ora, Harimai. Wonderful to see you all this evening. My name is David Toombs. I'm the Professor of Theology and Public Issues here at the University of Otago. It's an absolutely delightful to welcome you to this event organised by the Centre for Theology and Public Issues and to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, Professor Johanna Steibert. Johanna is both local and global. She's local because she spent some of her schooling here in New Zealand, in Wellington, but also here in Dunedin, and then took her first degree at the University of Otago in English literature and also Hebrew Bible. From there, she did further study at Cambridge and at Glasgow, and subsequently took positions at the University of Cumbria, the University of Botswana, the University of Tennessee, and now her current position is at the University of Leeds. She's very involved in both the scholarly work around Hebrew Bible, but also various activism projects. And we're absolutely delighted that she's spending a week with us here in Dunedin at the moment as part of a longer visit back to New Zealand, and she'll be talking to us this evening about uh, her work around Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and the Hebrew Bible. It's a particular pleasure to welcome those of you who are joining us on the live stream, or, and of course those who are watching this in retrospect on recording. For those of you who are watching on the live stream, if you wish to take part in the Q&A process, the easiest thing to do is to email your questions to me at david.tombs at otago.acnz. If you're unsure of any of those spellings, just do a quick Google for me at Otago and you should find my email address. I'll try to keep an eye on emails coming in and then I'll relay your questions to Johanna as part of the Q&A. I think that covers everything. So at this point, delighted to pass over to you, Johanna. We look forward to your remarks. Good afternoon. It's an absolute delight to be here. I hope I'm audible. Am I? Yeah, yeah I am. Wonderful. Uh, yes, it's something of a homecoming, and uh, there are some familiar faces in the audience from all different walks of life, including one of my first Hebrew teachers, Paul Trebilko, <laughs> who was here when it all began. So it's, it's really uh, moving and, and lovely to be here. Uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions afterwards. I hope the talk isn't uh, too disturbing. I've really tried hard. Uh, some of the content, given uh, the title already, the events around Black Lives Matter and Me Too, are, of course, distressing and disturbing. I've tried hard to make sure that the images are not, but it's always unpredictable to know what is uh, upsetting. Um, and I'd be... Uh, very happy to hear from you afterwards if there is any advice for me as to how I can do this or that better. Uh, thank you very much uh, also to David for the lovely introduction. So the aim of this paper is to discuss how two trauma-initiated mass movements, Black Lives Matter and Me Too, have exerted impact on biblical studies. It looks at their commonalities at who is made vulnerable, and at harnessing the positive potential of both movements. The past decade was punctuated by multiple large-scale, far and wide-reaching activist movements. Many of these were precipitated by tragedy and express individual and collective trauma, including through use of social media and digital cultures and engagement with the Bible and biblical studies. This is true of both Black Lives Matter and Me Too. And this paper attempts to interread the two modern protest movements with the Bible through a trauma lens. And let me begin with some description of the elements in the interreading. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, their absorption into biblical studies and relationship with trauma. And on the slide there, my slides, incidentally, are rather more like a chorus in a Greek play. They're not essential, but they do sometimes provide some, some interesting uh, commentary, or oh, I hope they do. 
Uh, the books on the slide there are just some of the books that are relevant to the background of this paper. So Digital Feminist Activism uh, was published before Me Too, but gives a sense of the very strong lead up to the Me Too movement. The Bible and Social Media and Digital Culture, I really recommend this book about the increasingly significant role and the diverse roles of the Bible in the digital sphere. And the method of interreading is one that I've developed together with the co-authors in the book there, Sacred Queer Stories, which is an example of interreading uh, life stories with Bible stories. And um, it goes into more depth about the kind of method that um, I'm going to be using here. So first, some background about the elements of the interreading. So Black Lives Matter, well, that image hasn't come up, that's a shame. Uh, Black Lives Matter was first formed in 2013. Its catalyst was George Zimmerman's acquittal for second degree murder and manslaughter after shooting dead unarmed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin as he returned from a convenience store with a pack of Skittles. Since then, the movement has carried out anti-racist advocacy and protests on the streets and digitally, both in the USA where it originated and well beyond. In 2020, in the wake of George Floyd's murder by Derek Chauvin, which was captured by teenager Danella Frazier on her phone and widely distributed just hours later, the spread and visibility of Black Lives Matter surged. Trauma and trauma testimony above all associated with violent killings of black individuals, are deeply enmeshed in the movement's pulse and fabric. One memorable example of too many is by Danella Frazier, by then aged 18, who was among the first witnesses called by the prosecution to testify in the trial of Derek Chauvin. She spoke of the enduring pain and regret she felt for not physically confronting the four officers at the scene of George Floyd's murder. In her words, it's been nights I stayed up agonizing and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. She reported how George Floyd's murder had haunted her and that she suffers from anxiety. In court, she wept, saying, when I look at George Floyd, I look at my dad, I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they're all black. I have a black father, I have a black brother. I have black friends. Frazier's testimony illustrates and personalizes the American Psychological Association definition for trauma as originating in a disturbing experience, in this case one caused by violent human behavior, that results in significant fear, helplessness, dissociation, confusion, or other disruptive feelings intense enough to have a long-lasting negative effect on a person's attitudes, behavior, and other aspects of functioning, and often challenging an individual's view of the world as a just, safe, and predictable place. Black Lives Matter and the acknowledgement of trauma and need for healing to which it has given rise are by now absorbed into black theology and womanist biblical interpretation. Mitzi Smith's womanist sass is one powerful example from 2018. And both Marcus George Halley's Proclaim of 2020 and Edward Donaldson III's The Black Lives Matter Movement towards an intersectional theology of 2021 attribute the catalyst for their books to personal trauma and spiritual turmoil brought on by the fatal shooting of yet another black man, Michael Brown, by yet another police officer, Darren Wilson, in Ferguson, Missouri on the 9th of August, 2014. Like Black Lives Matter, Me Too combines hashtag activism and in-person protests. Founded in 2006 sorry, by Tarana Burke, it became massive, going viral and global in late 2017 through the exposure of sexual abuse allegations against film producer Harvey Weinstein. The aim of individuals adding their Me Too to the deluge of revelations of sexual abuse, ranging from microaggressions to rape, was first to draw attention to and expose the colossal scale and extent of sexual harassment, assault, and discrimination, and second, to rally victims and survivors to find strength in numbers 
and collectively to challenge both perpetrators and rape supportive mechanisms. While trauma, personal and collective, is part of the movement, actor Alyssa Milano, whose tweet led to the 2017 surge of Me Too, has emphasized that one aim of her hashtag was to create a platform where those disclosing traumatic experience had an opportunity without having to go into detail about their stories if they did not want to. Me Too is also appearing in theological and biblical studies interpretations. As with the books Responding to Black Lives Matter, the tone is often personal, even confessional. This is the case with Boaz Johnson's The Marys of the Bible of 2018, as well as Ruth Everhart's The Me Too Reckoning of 2020 and Miriam Clough's Vocation and Violence of 2022. All are self-revealing examples of what Kelly Brown Douglas has called the spirituality of resistance, aimed at maintaining both dignity and agency of one's body. Embodiment and self-conscious inclusion of self in a larger collective entity is a ritualized part of both movements and simultaneously a display of vulnerability. As Annette Weissenrieder puts it, the body is the quiet medium of our relations to the world and displays and represents a fundamental condition of vulnerability. The articulation, me too, sometimes accompanied by raising of the hand, like taking a knee, are rituals that simultaneously communicate participation and vulnerability. Actions that shape individual bodies, express identities, communicate social relations. As Francesca Stavrakopoulou writes with reference to cultic observance or religious materiality, here the body participates in its own construction takes part in a recursively engaged social project brought into being through practices, social relations, and cultural performances. Abby Day similarly speaks of belief as less preformed than lived, embodied, and performed, as emotion and corporeal experience in human relationships, a performative belief that adjusts to given social contexts, expectations, and aspirations. And such is... Uh, really quite a significant part of protest. So on the slide there, you see the taking of the knee by Eric Reed and Colin Kaepernick. Um, but it also takes other forms uh, through embodiment, sometimes taking uh, dress into account as well, um, and sometimes through reclaiming. So some examples on the slides there, uh, the so-called pussy hat, which we saw during the uh, protests against uh, Donald Trump in reference to his very derogatory remarks that were leaked uh, in the lead up to the election which saw him win. Um, and uh, that kind of demonstrates a reclaiming of that, of that word. So a word used in a, in a derogatory sense, reclaimed in the protest movements. And I really like the image there on the bottom left where you see these Swedish trade unionists wearing the pussy hats with pride, which is always lovely to see, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that gesture of uh, solidarity there. Um, another example of reclaiming this time of a word is the so-called uh, the, the so slut marches. Uh, that's in allusion to, again, a derogatory remark made by a police officer in Canada telling women not to dress like sluts if they want to avoid being uh, sexually assaulted. And again, that word is reclaimed there um, and worn as a, as a badge in public in the slide on the top right there. So um, quite a significant part of, of protest. Okay. Black Lives Matter and Me Too have in common that their origin is in marginal black spaces. Tarana Burke, founder of Me Too, grew up in a housing project in the Bronx. Herself a survivor of childhood sexual assault, she began her activism as a teenager to set about improving the lives of young girls living in marginalized communities and of minoritized girls who have suffered extreme hardship. Black Lives Matter was initiated by Alicia Gaza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Cullors, three queer black women activists. 
From its beginnings and subsequently clearly articulated in its 13 tenets, the movement focuses on a commitment to diversity that vocally opposes sexism, misogyny, and male-centeredness, and that is queer and transgender affirming. There are also criticisms of the two movements, and sometimes these criticisms can be interread. Let me give two examples. First, Me Too has been widely and legitimately criticized for re-marginalizing black women and girls. Burke herself expressed the view in 2018 that the movement she had founded had become unrecognizable to her. Zahara Hill, among other black activists, has pointed out that black women were left out of the dialogue that spurred the movement and quickly isolated, not because black women are any less impacted or harmed by sexual assault or misogyny, but because focus and attention shifted to white women. At the center of Black Lives Matter, and brought into stark focus by the developments of the Me Too movement, is that some lives and tragedies get more attention and visibility than others. As Hill points out, the outrage simply wasn't there for the black women who were put in vulnerable positions. Just as outrage at the killing of black men by white police officers was slow to reach widespread pitch in predominantly white spaces. What has, in other contexts, been discussed in terms of attention inequality, missing white woman syndrome, or the findings of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, to give just a few examples of very many, confirms these tendencies amply. In spite of its origin in black activism, Me Too has privileged and foregrounded white women and their experiences. In spite of the origin of Black Lives Matter in the queer black community, Violence against members of the queer, transgender, and gender non-conforming black community is not prominent or prominent enough in the movement. And in both cases, this is not on account of less violence against either black women and women of color or against queer, gender non-conforming, and transgender black individuals. The second criticism is that both movements have been shown to re-traumatize victims of racial or sexualized violence. The uploads of footage showing the killing of Philando Castile and George Floyd, like the testimonies of thousands upon thousands of victims and survivors of sexual abuse, on the one hand, brought mobilization, visibility, and vindication for and on behalf of many who had suffered and died without so much as acknowledgement of injustice, but on the other, the resulting trauma and re-traumatization were not met with adequate support or help. And sometimes visual imagery makes that rather clearer, and um, I, I have tried to find something here that, that, that doesn't make that too graphic, but makes it visually striking. And there is a site called The Nib that I recommend here. It's, um, they, they publish cartoons, very often commentary on current events, and there were several examples there responding to Me Too in this case. case. So the first one there on the top right, um, likened the situation that Me Too drew attention to, to living in a monkey cage, but you don't know you live in a monkey cage until someone tells you that you do, and that the Me Too movement was likened to that. And then the cartoon on the bottom left there makes the point that Me Too, on the one hand, drew attention to the very many people affected by microaggressions through to severe examples of sexual violence, but that they were victims who were not being uh, given uh, attention, who were falling through the cracks. And that is uh, what is drawn attention to here by a, um, a, a, a transgendered male. So um, sort of the, this claim that, that they felt excluded by, by Me Too. And here, um, some more examples the, illustrating the re-traumatization yeah, of the, 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 the Me Too all around and how um, that often didn't have the effect of making one feel empowered and, and having uh, support all around, but actually feeling hounded by the disclosures all around. And that not everybody felt that this is something they wanted to be part of or join in on, and yet felt uh, socially pressured to do so. So um, uh, some, some really great examples there. That site, the nib, is one I, I often uh, turn my students to. And 
Then this artist here is somebody um, I'd like to flag up as well. To my shame, I hadn't heard of Titus Kafer, an African-American artist, uh, until the uh, Time magazine issue uh, where he, um, his artwork was on the cover. So Titus Kafer uh, is best known for his reinterpretation of master painters. Uh, so on the top right there, there is a very famous portrait of uh, President Jefferson, but he show, shows it peeled back, revealing and looking out from behind it uh, the face of um, his mistress, uh, Sally uh, Hemings. And he also, in the image on the bottom right there, takes images of masters, but erases the white faces. You see there these kind of ghostly faces and then he has a black face looking out, drawing attention to the people who are so often or too often marginalized. And on the cover of Time magazine, um, he shows, the, the image shows a black woman uh, in contemporary dress clutching a child to her chest, but the child is not represented. We have this empty silhouette there. And it quite clearly uh, recalls the Madonna and child image but it also alludes to the mothers of the disappeared, this, these protest movements uh, that we associate particularly with uh, um, uh, the, the area that David Toombs works on, so the Latin America uh, in particular. So his images are, are very striking examples of protest uh, that really came to the fore uh, during Black Lives Matter. Now, when we bring the Bible into the mix, we can ad identify yet more ways how the success and enormous visibility of the movements has brought with it some rather unwelcome consequences. And I apologize for the next slide. There we have some images. I'll, I'll talk about them in a minute. Few images in recent news coverage proved as divisive as that of President Donald Trump brandishing a Bible outside the St. John's Episco Episcopal Church Parish House at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests on the 1st of June in 2020. And comparing sex offenders such as Bill Cosby or those plausibly accused of sexual offenses such as Brett Kavanaugh and Donald Trump to Jesus, Joseph and King David respectively attempts to discredit Me Too while dignifying, even valorizing men against whom in two cases, Cosby and Trump, numerous accusations have been made. In one case, Cosby's leading to a conviction, which was, however, overturned three years later, albeit amid yet more allegations. But perhaps it has not been all bad. Unlike other mass protest movements of the same decade, the Arab Spring Uprisings, March for Our Lives, Occupy, or Extinction Rebellion, for instance, both Black Lives Matter and Me Too not only have particularly high visibility, but some ongoing influence, including in predominantly white spaces, including in academia and in theology and biblical studies. Both have made impact. Hence, while advocacy against sexism, sexual predation, and racism are hardly new, hardly born of these movements, visibility of such advocacy, or at the very least, desire to be seen to take this advocacy seriously, is striking. There is more vocal calling out of sexually inappropriate conduct, more vocal support for and inclusion of early career scholars, often with particular emphasis on postgraduates and early career scholars who are women or from minoritized communities. There is more explicit reference to mental health care and protection. Such language as diversity, inclusive reading lists, decolonizing the curriculum, and trigger warnings is much more prominent, as is attention to and record keeping of representation. Manuals, or collections of papers that include only white male authors are now rarely promoted without encountering criticism or outrage or ridicule. In June 2020, Black Lives Matter precipitated statements on the right to protest and statements calling for reflection and for support for the scholarship and careers of black scholars from the Society of Biblical Literature, 
and Society for Old Testament Study, among other academic bodies. On August 12th and 13th of 2020, the Society of Biblical Literature hosted Black Scholars Matter, a two-part online event, Visions and Struggles and Lessons and Hopes, each of two-hour duration, featuring 12 black scholars. The promotion and profile of, I'm guessing, the size of attendance by white scholars at an all-black symposium was unprecedented in SBL history. How deeply and ultimately how transformative these various calls to action are and will be remains to be seen. Are these high visibility efforts genuine and concerted or fleeting and superficial? Are they brief surges of a fast beating heart or sustained changes of heart? There has been some suspicion and some fear that much of the talk and action has been predominantly performative, even opportunistic. And some expressions of academic engagement with Black Lives Matter and Me Too, like hashtag activism on a broader scale, have been faulted for what is sometimes called slacktivism or virtue signaling. But I'm determined to be a little bit more optimistic. One revelation for me comes from a comparison with what might be considered a forerunner of both movements. And here I'm focusing most closely on the movement's later viral forms, years after their inception, and on their influence and presence also in predominantly white settings, which pertains in the case of Me Too to late 2017 onwards, and in the case of Black Lives Matter to mid-2020 onwards. The forerunner I'm referring to is Coney 2012, launched in 2012 by Invisible Children and directed and fronted by Jason Russell. Remember that. Watching Russell's rousing call to action now, 10 years on, is eye-opening. It does make me wonder how we may reflect in a few more years on our hashtagging or posting of black squares on Facebook. These have been described as forms of non-activism, as lightweight activism, and as mass expression of solidarity by non-activists, as well as as ignorant and obstructive in that hashtagging with Black Lives Matter in particular can actually hinder activists in staying informed about demonstrations from making financial donations or documenting racial violence by police because a digital feed is instead filled with black squares. It could also more charitably be expressive of giving some voice to a sense of trauma beyond words. After all, one of the most difficult aspects of trauma or recovery from trauma is that trauma both resists yet demands expression and leads to the disintegration of language yet relies on language. But returning now to Kony 20, 2012, I do think the video would not now, post Black Lives Matter and post Me Too, find the widespread and often rapturous reception that it did find a decade ago. By some measures, the Coney 2012 film was the most viral video ever, beating the speed of Susan Boyle's audition video in reaching 100 million views. Later in the same year, the Gangnam Style video would exceed Coney 2012 in total views, but again, more slowly. In Ryan Fan's words, at the height of Coney 2012 dissemination, it felt as though anyone who wasn't posting about Coney was complicit and indifferent to child slavery, genocide, and child rape. Trauma is depicted up close in the film, which features children in Gulu in northern Uganda seeking safety in camps where they sleep on the floor in a jumble of limbs. At one point in the video, as Russell is interviewing a child, a voice can be heard saying he is making safeguarding work difficult. In another distressing excerpt, another child, Jacob, breaks down as he recalls witnessing the murder of his brother. Jacob sobs that it would be better for him to die. This harrowing footage is interspersed with footage of Russell's adorable young son making films together with his dad that feature pretend combustions and identifying Joseph Coney as the bad guy who must be stopped. The white savior complex has certainly not gone away, but in the words of one Twitter commentator, Coney 2012 is white savior industrial complex. While Coney 2012 unsurprisingly received vocal criticism, including from Ugandan ac activists, 
its reception was overwhelmingly positive. A film like Coney 2012, showcasing so bluntly and exploitatively the trauma of young Ugandan children alongside white saviors, and ignoring so completely the gendered aspects, including sex slavery, of the violent conflict in Uganda, would, I think, today encounter far more outrage than it did just a decade ago. And Me Too and Black Lives Matter have played an important role in this. Turning to Me Too and Black Lives Matter in biblical studies, it is not only the case that both have exerted influence in terms of statements by societies or conduct at conferences or representation in forums or publications, but, as already indicated, also in the practice of biblical criticism. This has made inroads into interreading trauma, trauma in texts alongside trauma in present-day contexts. One reason for this is because, as Juliana Klaassens argues so persuasively, much of the Bible itself is trauma literature, texts that, in one way or another, respond to the effects of personal and collective disasters, where the ongoing trauma caused by structural violence associated with aspects such as gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and class find, finds expression. Such trauma and such impulse for expression is similarly at work also in the two protest movements. While the thrust of both Me Too and Black Lives Matter has been felt in biblical studies, its impact has also remained limited in that discussion of Me Too is still predominantly among scholars identifying as women and discussion of Black Lives Matter still predominantly among scholars identifying as black as emerges also from the bulk of sources cited so far. Notwithstanding concerns about mansplaining or appropriation, which can be avoided with just a bit of effort and self-critique and with not all too much difficulty, this needs to change. Sexism won't budge if it is left for women to resolve, and racism is overwhelmingly a white problem, not a black problem, and requires white attention, education, and action. As African-American theologian Edward Donaldson III puts it, what we need in this epoch of time is white responsibility. Now, I do realize I'm kind of um, sliding over some very complicated things in this language of white and black, um, and that is by necessity because it is very complicated and it would, it, it would take a lot of time to, to nuance that a lot more. But um, I am following Donaldson here in uh, that white is understood above all as a social construct of power and domination rooted in anti-blackness, um, far more so than in um, the actual color of one's skin. And that racism is about more than a black and white matter that was recently in, in, in England, and I'm sure it reverberated here too, drawn to our attention in Whoopi Goldberg's, uh, uh, not ill-meant, but, uh, but um, incorrect comment uh, about race pertaining to uh, the Third Reich that was in the context of the cancellation in Tennessee of um, the book Mouse. So I, I did just want to mention that I'm aware of that, but um, I'm necessarily um, uh, keeping, keeping this discussion rather shorter than would be ideal. So um, let me next um, uh, turn again to biblical studies. In biblical studies, womanist scholars have been at the forefront of nuancing awareness of trauma, racism, and gendered discrimination, as well as of their intersectional interplay and inseparability. This provides an important wake-up call, a call that has been vocal and articulate, but not heeded. I'm thinking here, for instance, of the question of Makosa Tsana Nzimande, who in her paper on 1 Kings 21 asks, Whatever happened to the struggles of Naboth's wife? So that chapter, 1 Kings 21, is the story of Naboth's vineyard. And that's what she asks. Whatever happened to the struggles of Naboth's wife? It's a question I, for one, had never thought to ask. Nzimande's question comes from a place of acute sensitivity, not only to the challenges to readers on both sides of the colonizer-colonized divide, women and men alike, 
but also to the reality that in settings of economic precarity, women are likely to suffer disproportionately. In Zimande demonstrates that Jezebel in this biblical chapter may indeed be an example of a powerful woman, but that this power comes at the expense and trauma of others, like Naboth's dispossessed and marginalized wife. And Zimande concludes, here lies a typical example of the lack of solidarity between colonized and colonizer women, exemplified by the feminist uncritical endorsement of Jezebel's role on the less powerful, both in her time and in our contemporary post-colonial and neo-colonial reading contexts. Mitzi Smith, like Nzimande, also points out that as a womanist, she cannot analyze texts, contexts, and readers through the framework of gender and ignore issues of race, or through the lens of race and overlook concerns of class. Indeed, there are plenty more biblical texts of female bodies in pain that, like 1 Kings 21, depict or suppress trauma and also interface gendered and racialized aspects. And on the slide there are just some of the examples that uh, readily come to mind at just those intersections where we have gender and uh, ethnicity um, interfacing in really quite complex ways, which is not always adequately acknowledged. So uh, Genesis 16, 19, 21, and 34, so the stories of um, uh, Hagar and Sarah, uh, the story of Dina's rape by Shechem. Uh, we, we have examples of that gendered and racialized dynamics at work. Numbers 25 and 31, um, again, the stories of the, of the Midianites there, uh, very distressing examples um, of, of gendered and racialized violence. Um, Deuteronomy 21, the case of the captive wife, um, a legal text. Judges 19, uh, the story set in Gibeah, um, the, 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 the awful story of the Levite's wife, that is. And same with Ruth and Esther 1 and 2. Esther 1 and 2 um, has recently been discussed by womanist scholar uh, Erica Dunbar in terms of uh, trafficking there of the girls uh, uh, to, uh, to Ahasuerus um, Harim. So uh, it's, it's womanist scholars who've been really at the forefront at calling our attention to these things. Surely Black Lives Matter and Me Too remind us forcefully to listen to what womanist interpreters in particular have been saying for some time. Where womanist and black theologians critically examine constructions of whiteness and blackness in and out of the Bible, criticism by white folk on such themes is still relatively sparse and often limited in perception. My interpretation of Genesis 34 is an example and was legitimately critiqued by Musa Dube for missing nuances of the gendered inter-ethnic relations she identifies so particularly astutely. What Dube is attuned to in her post-colonial feminist reading of the dynamics between Hebrews and Hivites is rather different from the anthropological readings of Julian Pitt Rivers and Helena Zlotnick that I explored. Dube offers another plausible and insightful reading to consider Shechem in this story as an indigenous colonized man who dares, in the imperializing terms of the text, to take a colonizer's woman. Dube is clear about the gendered violence of rape committed by Shechem against Dina, and also about the racialized and gendered violence committed by the Israelites against the Hivites. Dube writes, Dina's efforts are met with fierce resistance first by Shechem, whose sexual violence stops her from meeting the women of the land, second by her brothers, who kill all Hivite men to return her back to the colonizer's camp. Dube, like Nzimande, also remembers and calls attention to the even more marginalized unnamed Hivite women and children. As she points out, they are forcefully brought to her camp. Ironically, the women finally meet. The voices of women from both camps remain unheard, awaiting our hearing. They bring before us Gayatri Spivak's question, can the subaltern speak? It is in this broken landscape that the post-colonial feminist framework invites dialogue. 
Now, there are white scholars who have for some time already demonstrated in their work the kind of awareness and sensitivity to trauma and its gendered and racialized dimensions present in the biblical text and resonating on into the present, which womanist scholars have been at the forefront of calling out. Much of the body of work by Harold C. Washington, uh, as early as 1998, he was one of the first people to refer to rape culture in, uh, as a category in um, uh, biblical um, examination, as well as Juliana Claassen's, are examples. What is particularly encouraging to see, and I believe finally amplified both by Me Too and Black Lives Matter, and by the explicit subject, subjectivity of womanist criticism, is more self-reflexive biblical criticism by white scholars. One example here is by Jamie R. Reeves that I want to focus on next. Uh, in her article, Sarah as Victim and Perpetrator, Whiteness, Power and Memory in the Matriarchal Narrative of 2018. Directly pertinent to this paper, Reeves writes, in the context of Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and the recent television adaptation of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, the abuses of racism, patriarchy, and exploitation of women should be in the forefront of our minds when we read the Sarah narrative of Genesis. Reeves, in her reading of Genesis 16 and 21, writes that in this text, Hagar becomes black because she is a slave and is the one cast out. Sarah is white because this is her, or our story, and she is the slave's master. This leads Reeves to go on that any desire to identify with Hagar over Sarah is wishful thinking. Womanist biblical interpretation tradition calls for white women like her to realign our imaginations and see ourselves not as the marginalized character, but in the role of the text's oppressor. The text and a community who reads that same text and has daily experiences of oppression asks of Reeves to recognize that because of her position as a white woman, she has wittingly or unwittingly been in the role of Sarah more often than in the role of Hagar. Reeves concludes, in the story between Sarah and Hagar, Sarah is the oppressor. In the story, I am Sarah. Just as Dubey acknowledged Chechem as victim and perpetrator, in his case, a perpetrator of sexual violence against Dina, and a victim of what Dubé identifies as colonialist violence, so Reeves identifies Sarah as victim and perpetrator. As a woman in a patriarchal culture, she is exploited and rendered vulnerable to rape. As ideologically empowered through her class and ethnic identity, she perpetrates violence against Hagar. As Reeves makes clear, acknowledging such coexisting realities, delving deeper and being receptive to challenge, can lead to a positive transformation in terms of how we view and operate within the world. Reeves attributes her interest and focus in the narrative to influence from all of Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and womanist theology, stating that the, these throw into relief for her the racial, gendered, and political implications of slavery and surrogacy in this narrative. Reeves follows the trail of how the narrative has been used by white American slaveholders in the 19th century who read this text as confirmation that slavery was a God-ordained institution and that God sides with their interest in commanding return and submission to disobedient slaves up to the present. Reeves casts doubt on the shared blame sometimes attributed to Hagar alongside Sarah in the light of the verb kalal, to be light or trifling, used of Hagar in reference to her regard for Sarah at Genesis 16.4. As Reeves points out, we only hear of Hagar through either Sarah or the narrator, which alerts her suspicion. Reeves writes, in light of Black Lives Matter, white people calling the cops on black people for simply living their lives and innumerable stories of racism, assault, and harassment in the news today, it behooves us to be aware of whiteness and err on the side of believing the oppressed instead. Concluding her analysis, Reeves stresses the importance of remembering the bad for the common good, so that traumatic memory is not put aside, which would allow it to perpetuate legacies of injustice. Reeves puts this as 
If I, as a white woman, am Sarah in the story, then I am called to recognize my power and do differently, to interrogate, to interrogate the ways in which I perpetuate injustice through personal behaviors and complicity in systemic abuse, and to work for positive, liberating change. Reeves is reading, consciously influenced by womanist biblical criticism and theology, as well as by Me Too and Black Lives Matter, represents an important and welcome practice of self-critical self-reflection on whiteness and of trauma engagement. The traumas, often multiple traumas, personal and systemic, disclosed by many, including womanists, who have been kept at the margins of biblical studies, are finally beginning to be seen and heard by those who particularly need to see, listen, and engage. SBL's president-elect taking the office in 2023 to 24 is black Mapswana post-colonial feminist Professor Musa Wenkosi Dube. All issues of JBL since 2020 have shown marked attention to and improvement in inclusion and diversity. Edinburgh University advertised a post this year for a lecturer in religion and decolonization, for someone who will contribute to an understanding of how knowledge about religion is produced and what we may gain from current academic debates around inclusion and diversity. A recent scholarship advertised at the University of Leeds, which incorporates theologies to confront climate catastrophe and extinction of species, for the first time ring-fenced one scholarship for a black, Asian, or minority ethnic student. Very small steps, but important ones. It appears that Me Too and Black Lives Matter, while by no means achieving all their aims yet, if indeed they ever will, have been heard, including in biblical studies and in criticism of the Bible. Central to this is that the traumas that initiated both movements have found resonance, both in the extensive work already done by womanist scholars and in trauma texts of the Bible itself. Important to remember is that both sets of texts, womanist interpretation like that of Mitzi Smith and others, the possible backdrop drop of much biblical literature, like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, are seeped in trauma, which has taken and continues to take emotional labor and toll. What still needs to change more is the persisting implication and perception that scholarship that is explicitly subjective, like scholarship that is explicitly activist, is at worst self-indulgent and at best still not properly scholarship. Indeed, trauma studies and reception of the influences of Me Too and Black Lives Matter may be one way into challenging this and a way to make the discipline receptive to more layers in the text and also more empathetic. The hope is that maintaining the momentum of Me Too and Black Lives Matter will engage empathy and empathetic activism on the streets, in the digital sphere, and in our reading and writing including of biblical texts. Thank you.